Oh, I see my teammate, Sean Meredith is on. Hi, Sean. Yeah, you can see the participants. Yeah. My uh, colleague on the International Disability Rights Team, Charlie Kelly. Excellent. Okay, here we are at the noon hour. So thank you all so much for, for joining us from around the country and around the world. Um, this is a really exciting opportunity to launch um, a series of conversations around ADA 30, focusing on sport and physical activity. And we had a series of groups coming together, uh, Disability and Sport International, um, Lakeshore and, and NICPAD, and also um, you know, FAPA, National, the North American Association for um, Adaptive Physical Activity, and then also IFAPA. So we had a credit collaboration here on this group, and today we're so honored to have Ian uh, and Cody um, with the State Department joining us, a uh, national, international leader on disability rights. Um, before we turn over to Ian, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Bob Duhano from NICPAD for a few comments, um, and then we'll turn it over to Ian to start us for today. So over to you, Bob. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Eli, and uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, this is actually a speaker series that we'll be starting off uh, probably about once a month. We'll look to have a speaker or leader in the disability community uh, to talk about uh, ADA 30, uh, our celebration, what it means to us, uh, you know, where we're at, where we're going. And uh, I know myself being brought up before ADA and after ADA definitely have seen changes, uh, but definitely we're taking one step at a time and definitely looking to move forward and very happy to have everybody on and more more excited having Ann as our kickoff speaker and uh, Ann I've known her for many years and outstanding leader and very fortunate to have her today and without further ado uh, here is Ann Cody. Oh thank you Bob and thank you Eli and I want to thank Disability in Sport International, uh, Lakeshore Foundation and Nick Pad as well as your partners, North American Federation of Adaptive Physical Activity and the International Federation of Adaptive Physical Activity for putting this series together. And I'm really honored to be able to um, be with everyone today to kick off this series. So what I'm gonna talk about today in the next 20 minutes or so is I'm gonna tell you about what we do at the US Department of State, our International Disability Rights Team, give you a little bit of a peek into the work that we do. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the Americans with Disabilities Act and a few other U.S. laws and policies and how they interact with at the, at the intersection of sport for people with disabilities and how we benefit from those policies. Then I'm going to just briefly talk about disability identity and the importance of it. And finally, just going to put some concepts um, up on the slides to for us to kind of trigger some conversation around. So looking to the future, what are the things that we should be thinking about? Um, so I will um, start with who we are at the US Department of State. Uh, our International Disability Rights Team works out of the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor, and we lead the Department of State's diplomatic engagement to combat discrimination and abuse against persons with disabilities. DRL's International Disability Rights Team drives the Department of State's efforts to ensure that disability rights are an integral and integrated part of U.S. foreign policy and foreign assistance. And we assist, the development of, we assist in the development of training materials, resources, and videos um, for our colleagues around the department. There are 75,000 people who work for the US Department of State around the world. So our objective is to develop their capacity to advance disability rights wherever they may be working. Sorry. So we have th three main lines of effort that we focus on um, in this work. We encourage and assist foreign governments to develop national laws that, that affect people with disabilities and protect their rights. Um, many countries around the world have ratified the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and are in the process of enacting laws or implementing laws. And with 30 years of experience with the Americans with Disabilities Act, we have a lot of great expertise to share with other governments. 
We assist civil society organizations, particularly disabled persons organizations, to advocate for disability rights. And we encourage all sectors of society to expand economic opportunities for persons with disabilities. This is an area that we've decided to focus on because employment and economic opportunity are extremely limited for people with disabilities around the world. We even experienced that to a degree here in the US. So um, we share the knowledge and information we have, but we also look to other countries um, for best practices on what's working. So how do we do this work? I thought I would provide just a couple of examples to give you a sense of um, a few of the initiatives that we've been working on. The first one is specific to um, economic empowerment. Our bureau and our team uh, partnered with the U.S. Department of Labor and U.S. Agency for International Development to conduct a survey of APEC economies, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation. And we published a report about the findings of that survey. The report is entitled Advancing Employment in, e in APEC for Persons with Disabilities, a baseline study of opportunities. Um, this report really um, is an analysis of the laws and regulations that exist in these APEC economies. And it also, um, also we were able to really provide some um, grounding uh, for findings and recommendations um, to address economic empowerment and promote economic growth for people with disabilities in those economies. The second example is that we've developed training videos for labor and economics officers that work at US embassies around the world as they collaborate with governments, businesses, and disabled persons organizations, as well as others, to, to promote labor and employment inclusion for people with disabilities. So now I'm gonna talk about the ADA. Um, the 30th anniversary of the ADA is, a, in a, is an opportunity to really stop and reflect on the tremendous benefits the transformation that those of us who live to experience pre-ADA and post-ADA um, have been able to observe and live firsthand. Um, the, the U.S. has been completely transformed um, in the past 40 years, certainly since I've been a person with a disability. The ADA accessibility guidelines provide specifications for um, building accessibility into our environments. And we've seen tremendous changes in the physical environment. Um, these guidelines have ensured that sporting venues, gyms, recreation facilities are accessible to people with disabilities from entering um, the front door or even driving into the parking lot. And entering the front door to the locker rooms, to the um, field of play, to the offices, or anywhere that people with disabilities might interface with these facilities as um, athletes or recreators or um, employees or vendors. Um, more recently, the ADA Recreation Facilities Guidelines were published. And while many recreation facilities were anticipating these guidelines and putting the recommendations that they're anticipating in place. Um, we've also seen um, an increase in accessibility um, at swimming pools, golf courses, uh, boating docks and ramps, and parks and trails because of those recreation facilities guidelines. So much more accessibility for recreating and participating in sports in our communities, which is really important. Now, the ADA also ensures that services and programs are accessible to people with disabilities and must be. So that means that the providers, the um, recreation providers need to make sure that people with disabilities can be included and accommodated in the types of programs and services that are available um, in, those, in those facilities. So that's really critical. So now we have 
really safe, accessible places to uh, recreate and participate in sports. And I just um, have a final bullet about public transportation and, the, and accessibility of rights of way, because this is really important as well. In order to um, access these opportunities, we have to be able to get to and from um, home to these, or from work, wherever we're um, transiting from, to these places. So it's a little bit trickier when you don't live in a large metropolitan area or a medium-sized city. Um, to find accessible transportation if you don't have access to it and that continues to be um, a, a barrier something that continues to need to be addressed certainly um, for those of us who have worked in sports at the community level a few other laws to mention the air carrier access act prohibits discrimination in air transportation by both domestic and foreign carriers. So any foreign carrier that's originating a flight in the US or ending a flight in the US has to meet Air Carrier Access Act regulations. So this obviously is important for uh, people with disabilities who wanna travel domestically, um, whether it's for sports or personal reasons or for business and work reasons. This is critically important um, as well as for athletes who are competing internationally. I just wanted to mention the Fair Housing Act um, because it prohibits housing discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, disability, family status, and national origin. The Individuals with Disabilities Education Act requires public schools to make available to all eligible students with disabilities a free, appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment appropriate to their individual needs. And this focuses specifically on access to um, classroom content, curriculum content for students who need that access. Um, students with other disabilities like mobility disabilities are protected under Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, which I'll talk about in a minute. I also just wanted to mention Title IX of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which, addre which addresses and, and prohibits gender discrimination in, in any education program or activity. And this is what led to um, equal access to extracurricular sports in interscholastic and collegiate programs for girls and young women. Now, fortunately for us, I'll show you a slide in a moment that compares Title IX to um, the Rehabilitation Act to the ADA um, that reflects some consistency there that we've benefited from. Uh, but on this slide, you see at the top the Amateur Sports Act Amendments of 1998. This, these amendments gave the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee responsibility as the National Paralympic Committee. That means they have to prepare athletes to um, compete in the Paralympic Games and the Parapan American Games. <clears throat> Oops, sorry. The Rehabilitation Act of 1973. This was the precursor to the Americans with Disabilities Act in many ways, and it prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability in programs conducted by federal agencies, those receiving federal assistance, in federal employment, as well as covers federal contractors. Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act states that no qualified individual with a disability in the US shall be excluded from, denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity that receives federal financial assistance. Now, this um, language is very similar to the Title IX um, language that's in that legislation. And I just want to um, mention Section 508, and then we'll go on to this other comparison slide. So Section 508 of the Rehab Act establishes requirements for electronic and information technology developed, maintained, procured, or used by the federal government. 
So websites and any online applications or information must be accessible to people with disabilities um, if it's related to the federal government. The slide that I have up now um, is a side-by-side -side comparison of Title IX regulations, Rehabilitation Act regulations, and ADA regulations, which um, actually apply to sports and recreation um, activities. So again, the language is very similar. Um, must not be, must not discriminate on the basis of sex or be excluded from participation in or be denied the benefits of or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity. Um, this language actually comes from the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So um, basically it's been consistently applied across these different civil rights laws. And um, it, it enables us to push for access to school, interscholastic sports opportunities, after school extracurricular sports, um, equal opportunities there, as the law states. And then non-discrimination, of course, um, in any programs that are provided in the community, um, they must be accessible. And, and people with disabilities must have equal access to those programs and services. So um, we've, made a lot, we've made a lot of progress, I think probably in the last 10 years in particular, on this particular issue um, in educating people and getting the um, US Department of Education to issue a Dear Colleague letter or uh, uh, a, a letter to public schools indicating that they have a responsibility to um, provide interscholastic sports opportunities to students with disabilities, for example. So that's been hugely beneficial. Um, obviously, the US Olympic and Paralympic Committee taking responsibility for Paralympic sport and athletes has been a major uh, benefit to us as well. Okay, I'm on to the next slide, disability identity. This is a fun topic to talk about and something that's very personal as well. And I think um, probably many of you who work in this field um, or participate as athletes um, or in other ways can identify with this. Um, disability identity is something that is, is vital to persons with disabilities. Um, it's so important for us to connect with other people who have similar life experiences and can share resources and benefits and experiences, right? Um, because many times when we acquire or, or are born with a disability, there's no one else in our family who has that disability. Now, um, there are some disabilities that are hereditary and familial, um, and people who grow up in those families are, are really at an advantage in, in that way. Um, but those of us who come into families that don't have experience with disability, there's a lot of learning and trial and error and you know, missteps. And then ultimately, if you find your community um, and really can embrace a, a disability as an identity or as a part of your lived experience, then you, um, your, your world will open up to you. And sport is one way to do that. And it's a way many of us um, who are, are participating today can relate to. Um, when, I, um, when, I, when I became disabled, I was 16 and I was an athlete. And I wanted to know if there was collegiate sport opportunities. And I discovered that there was. And when I landed at the University of Illinois, at Urbana-Champaign and was surrounded by other student athletes with disabilities. It was, it was a tremendous um, boost in my confidence, my sense of identity, um, the ability to learn from my peers and understand things and, you know, like share, share things and really develop a vocabulary and empowering voc vocabulary around what I was experiencing. So, so important. And the disability advocacy community share similar um, bonds and strength and peer networking and support that's so important. 
And many times we also, once we reach out and connect with other people with disabilities or disability organizations, we discover disability culture. Disability culture really, it, it involves sport and recreation, but it also involves um, creative and innovative um, arts and performance. So writing, um, visual arts, performing arts, really just connecting to people with disabilities who are doing all kinds of amazing things in our communities and the broader um, world. And we have the benefit um, through these virtual exchanges to really connect with people all over the world who are vital thinkers and um, innovators that can really help us take our work to another level. So, um, so this whole concept is really important. And I just want to mention um, some community-based organizations that you might want to connect with if you haven't. Um, independent living centers in the US are really wonderful resources. Um, local um, sports clubs or parks and recreation programs if you're looking for sports and recreation activities. Some colleges and universities, in some cases, rehabilitation hospitals and centers have, um, have programs that people can access sports through. Okay, finally, I want to just talk about some topics that we can consider today in our conversation or that you can kind of take away with you after the session and think about a little bit more in detail. With a human right, using a human rights framework. And the first thing is um, that I want to address is race. And in um, adaptive sport, disability sport, para sport, whatever you identify with, um, we do not see racial diversity. We do not see um, black people with disabilities. We don't see um, people of color with disabilities at, um, engaging at the levels that we need them to be. Um, so we, there must be barriers. We need, to, we need to acknowledge and own our responsibility in this um, in not having more racial diversity in the work that we do. We need to um, figure out how to address it and develop plans and strategies for engaging more people of color in sport for people with disabilities. Um, it's vitally important. We're missing out on, on their um, contributions, their innovation, their creativity, and their talent and abilities that they're gonna bring to, um, to our sports and to our network. So that's something that I encourage all of us to do, that we must do. That's like number one. Um, in the unprecedented time that we're living in with the global pandemic, the economic situation that we're facing is probably uh, unprecedented, at least in certain places around the world. I know the US, we're going to um, continue to experience that. We know that state and local governments are gonna be impacted um, their budgets are going to be impacted, which means that they're looking to cut programs. Um, we've seen schools, collegiate, collegiate and interscholastic schools, cutting sports programs in order to uh, cut their budgets. So that's something real that's going to affect us right away. It's also going to affect nonprofit organizations, um, our National Olympic and Paralympic committees. Um, budgets, our federal budgets um, are going to be impacted because of this pandemic. I put equipment affordability and access on here because this is a global issue. A lot of the technology that we use in adaptive sports that helps us access and, and be active can be really expensive. Um, so that's something to consider as well. How to, especially when we're looking at um, reaching out to marginalized communities who in the past haven't had access to these resources. So um, something to think about. Hiring persons with disabilities in sports positions, in physical activity positions. Um, we need to have people with the lived experience working in this field. 
not just as participants, but people working in the field. Um, so this message is as much to people with disabilities who are listening to this as it is to people making hiring and, and recruitment decisions. Sex, sexual abuse and harassment. We're seeing these issues come to the surface in Olympic sports, national and international sports. Um, don't be complacent. Sexual abuse and harassment is happening in disability sport as well. We have to assume that. Why? Because girls and women with disabilities are four times as likely to be abused than women and girls without disabilities. We are much more vulnerable as people with disabilities to sexual abuse and other types of abuse. So, you know, we haven't seen stories or reports or, or you know, complaints filed yet that have bubbled up to the public, but they're likely happening. Statistically, they're likely happening. So we really need to put measures in place. We need to be watching very closely um, and we need to be making sure that the people who are working in our sports with young people with disabilities um, are not sexual abusers. And finally, virtual sports engagement, like, kind of like we're doing today, but we're watching people get really creative and innovative about how they're training. We can look to our Olympic and Paralympic athletes in particular to see how they're training in this unprecedented time um, when they don't have access to their um, training facilities. So it's another, it's an exciting area and exciting time to think about how we can really take the knowledge and expertise that we have around um, sport for people with disabilities and share it more broadly around the world. So um, I'm going to stop there and turn it back over to Bob and Eli for a conversation. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Anne. That was a really great start for us and great to put the frameworks together um, and really just to engage this conversation. Um, particularly as we look at the ADA 30, but also as it intersects with inclusion and disability identity and kind of what does it mean for the sport environment. Um, we have a couple questions that have come in so far and then and, and there's a couple questions that I have, I know Bob as well. Um, but why don't we go ahead and first start with um, Jeff McCubbin, he has a question. Uh, while the ADA has created a framework for a free appropriate public education, the federal government has not necessarily addressed the funding for this program in 45 years. You know, what's happening with the IDA, um, any updates that you might be able to share, particularly as it relates to sport and inclusion? Well, <laughs> I, um, yeah, really trying to get to the full um, funding that the federal government um, committed to many years ago for IDEA is, is, a, is, um, is a challenge. We've never gotten there. Um, I know disability advocacy organizations work very hard on advocating for um, additional funding for IDEA to make sure that it's fully funded so that the states can provide um, the resources necessary, such as um, physical education and sport related programming. Um, but we, I, I, it's gonna be challenging in this um, budget environment, in particularly, in, in particular, um, to be, just to be quite honest, because even when we've had um, um, a really healthy budget environment, it's been challenging to get that money plus up. Um, but I know organizations, people work on this continuously to try to um, to increase that funding. So that's where we're at. I'm not sure the exact percentage of total funding um, at this current date, but um, thank you for raising it. It's really important. Thank you, Ann. Um, there's another question. A trooper Johnson uh, is asking a great question about um, reducing the barriers associated with participation. Um, and I guess the way that I see this question is also around, you know, we see a lot of awareness around race 
in society, you have more gender. And so, yeah, maybe to share your thoughts about with disability, how do we, how do we keep bringing awareness to disability and reducing the barriers, um, particularly around you know, making sure disability is not left out of the diversity and inclusion? Mm. You know, I mean, what are some ideas or strategies that, you know, that we just make sure that disability is not left out of these important conversations around diversity and inclusion? You know, um, great, this is a great question and conversation to have. And it's something that we're having at the State Department. And I think, you know, every institution that you're involved with, whether it's a university or a business or a nonprofit organization, should be having this conversation and out in your community. Um, the, the more people understand that disability is part of diversity and inclusion, the the better, right? And this conversation has to happen in any in every area, because you're absolutely right. It's not disability is not even considered in the whole diversity and inclusion arena. Um, but the more we're talking about it, the more places we're talking about it, um, the less likely people are going to be able to um, ignore it. But I think um, it really goes to disability awareness, which um all of us are doing all the time because of the nature of our work and the nature of the way we live our lives right just our integrity around ensuring that um, people with disabilities have um, full and equal access um, so uh, i just think really demanding and and putting the expectation on organizations and people who um who have responsibility for diversity and, and inclusion um, in their organizations is really important. Excellent. Thank you. Um, we, have a, a, we have a couple questions that are coming in now, so we'll just kind of take them in order. Um, a great question about the State Department, um, the consulate and embassies, how's the department looking at trainees and alumni as valuable resources? Um, maybe even talking about the sports diplomacy program and other kinds of programs the State Department is doing related to adaptive sport, um, yeah. but also in terms of how just overall training programs, inclusion. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we do, the International Disability Rights Team is we, um, one of the benefits of sitting where we do is we see what's happening across the department as it relates to disability and um, inclusion programs and we um, try really hard to to keep track of alumni with who come through the global sports mentoring program alumni with disabilities who come through all kinds of our exchange programs to the u.s and we um, make sure that our human rights officers who are working in embassies and consulates overseas know about them um, and reach out to them as resources for their human rights work. Because the human rights officers in particular, um, one, of, one of the things they're, they're responsible for is writing the human rights report. Um, the Department of State issues a country, country report on human rights for um, 180 countries around the world every year. We're mandated by Congress to write these reports. And our officers um, need to understand what's happening in, in the countries that they're working in. So they reach out to disabled persons organizations and alumni with disabilities um, to find out you know, how their government is doing in terms of disability rights. Um, and where there might be issues that can be highlighted in the human rights report. Um, because highlighting those issues then um, has those governments taking notice and being put on notice that they need to address those issues. So that's one way, but we also um, encourage um, the embassies to, to reach out to have people, those leaders with disabilities who come through our programs do uh, you know, roundtables in the embassy with staff so that they can educate them on the work that they're doing and on the situation of people with disabilities in those countries. So we absolutely um, take advantage of that and encourage our colleagues um, around the world to do that. They're a very valuable resource. 
Thank you, Anne. Um, there's a question here. Uh, so following up on how you talked about the leadership positions of hiring people. Um, and then Mike Frog actually makes a great comment about how this, particularly in women and women in sport, a lot of the leadership opportunities for women into leadership opportunities, both in sport and also outside of sport. Um, but also in terms of thinking about, you know, could this be or how can we continue to do that in terms of building more leadership opportunities for for individuals with disabilities to to be trained to get the capacity to grow mm -hmm. into these leadership positions um, you know what more uh, mike is kind of asking what else can we be doing and other any other thoughts you wanted to share in that regard i think um so programs specifically targeted at developing um people who are showing leadership and and um beginning to be leaders and influencers, you know, in their sphere, um, giving them opportunities to grow to another level of leadership. So it might be through formal programs, like the Global Sports Mentoring Program, um, where we're developing global leaders with disabilities um, in, in sports. Um, but those mentorship programs are really more like, there's a, um, you know, there's an a senior executive leader in a U.S. organization that partners with an emerging leader um, to help grow their talent and, and networks um, and understanding of what it takes to, you know, to develop sport in their countries. And I think that's something that that's a model that we could certainly look at, you know, in our own countries as well and in our own sports even. Um, presenting opportunities for um, athletes as they're, um, you know, as they're coming to the end of their careers to really step into some opportunities to grow and develop as leaders or as experts in their sport, if that's, if that's the place they want to go professionally. But it also takes people with disabilities in leadership positions to pull those, um, you know, developing leaders along. Um, it also, you know, just like with women, we need to have those people in, in decision-making positions in order to make that happen as well. And we, in those positions, need to take res that responsibility and leverage that opportunity that we have. Excellent. Well, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask kind of a question, and maybe Bob was as well, as we kind of encouraging audience to share. Um, I guess I wanted to turn to the realm of um, media coverage a little bit in terms of the kind of the, what I call the mascot stories or the water boy stories or kind of the, the stories that are out there around people with disabilities in the media and, and especially in sports and to me it's been one of the kind of issues that I feel like as a community we really need to try to tackle somehow mm -hmm. um, while we also value the disability experience and what it means to have a disability and so forth, but also we don't want to be tokens. We don't want to be the inspirational story, but yeah. maybe some thoughts on like, how do we get beyond that? Or how do we continue to educate? Or how do we push, change the paradigm so that we don't keep seeing these kind of, um, kind of water boy or mascot stories in the media, but we can kind of get to the sports stories and, um, and kind of, especially in the terms of ADA 30 and all this, like how do we move this conversation forward? Mm -hmm. It's a great question, and I know it's a it's it's a challenge that's um, particular to the United States media and audiences, um, mm -hmm. and I'm sure other countries as well. Um, um, uh, our coverage. There's so many directions I can go with this. <laughs> yeah, thoughts, perhaps, yeah. I um, you know, certainly media training is important when you're talking about athletes who are on, maybe on the national team or on a collegiate team, um, giving them the opportunities to develop through, you know, with media training is important. So, but I also think, and one thing that I found to be really important is for those of us who are, you know, who do have a, an opportunity or, you know, to, to speak for the broader community, it's really important to understand the disability rights and advocacy piece and that broader picture of disability. 
um, as athletes. And sometimes I know I didn't have time for it. You know, when I was an athlete, I was focused on my sport and, uh, you know, and all the education and work that went into that. Once I became more active in the advocacy side of it, I realized how that whole piece really just um, made me a much more effective advocate and leader within disability sport as well. But I think athletes um, who, you know, who have the platform need to understand that. And the importance of um, the words that you use, the language that you use, the things that you say, um, and how you can influence the writers or the interviewers who are asking the questions. You can educate them just through that interview process um, in terms of the way you respond to their questions or challenge them on the questions they're asking and why they're asking them. Um, and there are effective ways to do that, but it takes a little bit of training and, you know, to be able to do that effectively. And I think um, disability rights advocacy provides some of that, um, certainly, um, and it would be very beneficial um, to people who have that microphone, so, so to speak. Um, certainly, um, educating the U.S. media. Um, the dis again, the disability community does this when a writer uses language that's um, obsolete or offensive or really derogatory and not useful. Um, they're called out um, on that language, and, and that's something that we have to continue to do to educate um, people in the media about using language that's empowering and, um, you know, supportive. Yeah. Well, great. Well, thank you. It's just important that we mm -hmm. get your thoughts. I mean, it's important conversations and for all of the audience and for everybody. So, but your yeah. thoughts on it are really helpful. Um, so, yeah, I think I'll, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Bob. Bob, do you want to, any, any question you might have at this time? We have a few others that have come in as well, but. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking to, to, to turn it over to those callers okay. first. Uh, if, Perfect. If you, want, if you want to read them or you want me to read them. Uh, yeah, I can go ahead, yeah. Um, right. So the next question we have is a question about access. We talk about access in regard to physical access. Um, but what about some other ways of access? So um, thinking about social, emotional access, um, particularly as it relates to sports and recreation and thinking about institutional or structural ableism. Um, but how do we get not only looking at physical access, but also looking at um, social and emotional and it'd be wonderful to have your, your comments on that, Anne. Yeah, no, that's really important. And we, um, I think we need to ensure that we have experts, um, you know, in these areas, adaptive physical education and adaptive physical activity in particular, bring that expertise to, um, you know, to these settings to ensure that people with um, disabilities can participate actively and um, it, it, you know, in sports and physical activity. I think um, continuing education and training and taking advantage, like being aware of and, and seeking out training to ensure that your, uh, your programs are as inclusive as possible and also recognizing that um, so two things, um, people with visible, noticeable disabilities may also have secondary or non-apparent disabilities. Many of us have, don't just have one disability. Um, and also people who have, appear to not have a disability will, could have a non-apparent disability where they need an accommodation, they don't know how to ask for it, or um, they don't know that the accommodations are available in a particular setting. Um, so it's, it's up to us to ensure that, um, that the folks who work in, these, work in these recreational sports settings are familiar um, and getting the training they need. Excellent. No, it's, it's important that we are covering all aspects and dimensions, and this is great. We have a follow-up question about the, um, the State Department program and the sport exchange, um, and particularly the 
maybe just to share a little bit more about the program and kind of how it, how it works and um, particularly the international guests kind of getting involved. Okay. You know, I think it sounds like people are really interested in the program. Um, so maybe a little bit more you could share about it and how, and how it, especially over the last four years or so as it's grown. Yep, happy to do that. Well, the, Depart the State Department has a sports diplomacy division that's dedicated to using sport to engage uh, people from all over the world. And our embassies and consulates use the tools of sports exchange programs to connect um, Americans with people in the countries that they're serving in so that we can share experiences and exchange experiences. So there are a number of exchange programs that exist. Um, we have a sports visitors program um, where visitors from another country come to the US for two weeks and visit two to three um, different parts of the country to learn about um, sports and American culture while they're here. And um, there's quite a very, it's a packed schedule with um, lots of experiences with learning about sports and physical activity and physical education and recreation. Um, the embassy s identifies the participants. They're either coaches or youth ages 14 to 18, something like that. Um, and um, so we encourage people to connect with the U.S. Embassy or consulate nearest to you if you're interested in, ex in an exchange program. There's also a sports envoy program, which is where we send American athletes to other countries for, you know, seven to ten days of programming in that country. Um, the embassy staff identify and develop the program and the plan working with local disabled persons organizations and local government and, and any other entities that want to take advantage of having a U.S. sports expert um, there to, um, to promote um, access to sports, specific sports technical um, training camps or workshops and programs, whatever the interest is. So with disability sport, we often send Paralympic athletes or Special Olympics athletes or Deaf Olympic athletes over to, um, you know, but, but they work with people without disabilities, people with disabilities and all types of disabilities while they're there. It's really an all-inclusive um, type of experience. Um, and incidentally, when we have sports visitors come to the U.S., even if they're not a disability sport specific program, they get exposed to disability sport here in the U.S. Uh, might be a Special Olympics or Deaf Olympics program or some type of para-sport program as part of their experience. So that's a really important part of the philosophy. There's um, the Global Sports Mentoring Program, which may be the program you're talking about. Is, um, it's a four to five week long program that um, 16 to 18 persons per year participate in. And those persons are emerging leaders in disability sport in any area of disability sport who um, you know, who show promise in terms of being decision makers and influencers in their own country or community specifically. We encourage people with disabilities to apply for this program, but you don't have to have a disability as long as you're working in disability sport. And our embassies are responsible for identifying you and, and nominating you um, for this program. And then the nominations are taken and reviewed and selected um, based on your areas of interest and ability to really take what you learn here and have an impact back home. And then also on w whether or not you match well with a list of mentors here in the US, which are um, mentor organizations um, across the country who are doing sport um, and, and physical education for people with disabilities. Again, all types of things, and they may have a particular expertise. Lakeshore Foundation is a great example. They've been a wonderful mentor um, over the years for us in this program, but many others have as well. 
So, um, so that program is really, that creates, you, you feed into, once you've completed that program, you feed into this network of um, probably 200 now leaders around the world, not just the 18 people that you are here with, but you're connected to more than 200 people around the world who are part of this program. And the um, success rate in terms of people going back and implementing their action plan that they develop on this program is 80 some percent. It's a very high percentage rate um, and engagement is ongoing after the program is over. Um, so and we rely on our alumni in that program a lot. So it's a great program, as are all the sports diplomacy programs. Excellent. That's great. And thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. My pleasure. We have a great question, um, particularly looking about inclusion into mainstream uh, sport governing bodies, organizations, particularly how we look at strategies for, you know, educating or empowering sport administrators to try to increase representation around and, and uh, engagement policy and so forth um, by sport governing bodies. So, and perhaps you could share, it's a question from Mary Holmes, um, <laughs> but a great question about how do we get, you know, executive board members, sport organizations to kind of engage further into the uh, realm of disability adaptive I think um, it's it's important to have the the same conversation with executive leaders um, of sports organizations about the importance of diversity on their boards, um, about the reflect of reflecting diversity within their organizations through their programming. Um, I think. Also, it helps to point to other organizations that are doing it successfully and effectively. Um, we talk about this uh, when we're talking about hiring people with disabilities, right? With um, particularly with the private sector about the benefits of hiring people with disabilities. The same thing applies when we're talking about, um, you know, diversifying sports governing bodies and federations. People with disabilities bring our unique lived experience, which includes um, being great problem solvers and creative thinkers because we're always thinking, you know, 10 steps ahead of a, a non-disabled person about what needs to happen in our lives. We have to plan, we have to be strategic, we have to manage our resources, whether it's time or energy or financial. Um, we, we have some kind of skills and contributions to make that are going to make these organizations more effective, more successful. Um, and I think, it, you know, this is it's so important too to include, you know, racial diversity within our ranks for the same reason we're going to benefit from that diversity um, within our own ranks but also be contributing that to these organizations who um, really you know just don't think um, there's any benefit to engaging with us but we've got to convince them otherwise and we've got to be able to point to entities that are doing it right and really benefiting and right now the, the um, corporate sector is doing a great job with that. And we've talked about disability in and the member organizations there. Um, the International Labor Organization, ILO, you know, has a business leadership network. Uh, we're seeing this happen. So sponsor organizations of the Olympic and Paralympics are doing a better job of integrating or you know, hiring with disabilities and, and really taking advantage of our skills and strengths. So some of these um, Olympic and Paralympic sponsors might actually be good people to approach to ask them to help advocate with these sports federations that are just not willing to do it. So, so thank you. Mm -hmm. um, there's another really great question here about the ADA serving as an example for civic engagement since 
particularly around people with disabilities. And so, you know, not only around voting, but, you know, people with disabilities becoming more civically engaged. So Howard asked a great question about people with disabilities getting engaged in voting and being civically engaged, but perhaps we could expand that a little bit just about overall civic engagement from people with disabilities and whether that relates to voting or advocacy or, or whatnot. Yeah. Gosh, I mean, yeah, I think we recognize pretty early on that the, the deck, the card deck is stacked against us <laughs> in terms of the barriers that we're facing. And, you know, the world just wasn't created um, with us in mind. So we have to we have to change things, manage things. Um, and that includes policies, legislation, and that begins with educating lawmakers and decision makers at the local level, whether it's your county council or your, you know, your city council, mayors, you know, um, aldermen, people who have, um, who are in positions that can help. Uh, I think, so civic engagement is really important. Um, and it's something in the US that I think we really value, but we would like to see many more people get involved um, in civic engagement beyond the disability community. But if you have particular issues and concerns, um, you know, look for opportunities and look for organizations that can that can help you target your um, you know your efforts more effectively. Um, it's a better way to do that. But voting is very important. Uh, um, access to voting can be a challenge. Um, you know, we have laws that prohibit <laughs> discrimination in voting, and um, we've done a lot of work to try to make sure that um, polling places are accessible and that we're not um, identifying polling places that are inaccessible that people can go to um, and providing alternative voting opportunities such as curbside voting or voting by mail um, or early voting um, can make it easier for people with disabilities but paying attention and and we do have to pay attention to understand what our options are ahead of time because showing up at your polling place and discovering that it's not accessible is well it, you know well it's against the law it's also on us because we may not be able to cast our vote if we haven't researched it or or saw an alternative uh, way of casting our vote unfortunately it falls on us a little bit um, but everybody should be paying attention to um, what's important to them and seeking opportunities to um, to influence decisions and that's how it, you know, that's how democracies are run, um, so. so. I think we might have time for one more question or so. I, I'm gonna combine, we have a question about just social media, the power of social media. Mm -hmm. And then we also have a question about kind of the emergence of professional sports and more engagement by, the, by leagues to engage with adaptive sports. And so I started thinking about just the overall mm -hmm. promotion of, and, the emergence of adaptive and disability sport and how social media has helped, how different leagues are helping. And maybe you can kind of close on that question in terms of your thoughts on kind of the future and uh, maybe, you know, over the next five to 10 years where we're headed with all of this. Oh, wow. Thank you again so much for your time and <laughs> want to stick to time, but maybe a couple minutes to kind of close. Great. Um, well, I think, um, digital engagement and online engagement is so important and certainly social media provides, provided an opportunity for us to present sport for people with disabilities in a way that it hasn't been presented before uh, we saw that early on with the, um, with the internet and the international paralympic committee as an example of streaming um, sports as they were being contested live in the paralympic games um, going back to Beijing, I think, in 2008, perhaps 2004, I'm sorry, I don't remember, but really ensuring that international audiences could, you know, could see the games happening when they weren't being televised by, um, 
broadcasters in countries around the world. Now that's changed pretty dramatically, but accessing these um, sports and learning about them online is so important. And for people who are just getting involved or wanting to engage or find out what's available in terms of sport and, and recreation and physical activity, the internet is a tremendous resource for us. We can even go on and watch people participating in our sport and, and find instructional videos on how to engage in a sport. Um, things that were not available when I, you know, when I started in the 80s uh, in, in adaptive sport. So tremendous resources. Um, as far as like the, um, the professional leagues of sport, um, supporting the development of adaptive sports. Uh, you know, they're providing resources and visibility for adaptive sports, which is really beneficial and important. And I know so many local programs um, are benefiting from that and rely on that. And I think that's important as long as you're ensuring that you are not being used as a charity. <laughs> of the organization that your um that your sport is being promoted as a sport um you know as a community service uh, as an important resource for people with disabilities to engage in as perhaps a stepping stone for some athletes to go on to you know a higher level of competition if they wish to do that um, so I would just say, just try to avoid the charity model um, and getting so, you know, sucked into that if you're working for the professional league, um, because that messaging can be really um, detrimental yeah. to our work. Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, thank you so much, Anne, for, for sharing and for engaging in this hour, um, you know, continuing the conversation while the recording, and we can do follow up and um, if anyone wants to reach out, we'll be sure to make sure that connection happens. Um, we'll have the recording posted on NickPad and maybe by tomorrow or in the next couple of days. Um, but again, thank, thank you so much. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Are we going to have it captioned? I probably should have checked with you. Yeah, we, we'll make sure Gecko gets put on there. Great. Yes. Great. It's been um, a pleasure to be able to talk about yes. you know, two areas that I love so much and to, and to be with you all people who I've spent my um, sports and professional career working with and collaborating with. So it's been a pleasure. Thank you for kicking off this series. We'll, we'll have information soon about the next ones and upcoming. And, uh, but it's wonderful that Ian to kick off this, uh, you know, 8830 focusing on sport and physical activity. Um, so yeah, I guess we'll go ahead and close out here. And uh, thank you all again and for, for joining us. My Robert Bob, yeah. Thanks, Dan. Continue success, and uh, we appreciate all that you do. Yeah. Thank you, Bob. Thank you so much. Good luck with the rest of the series. Wonderful. Okay, thank you all. We had a great group, about 80 or so joining. And excellent. Okay, have a great rest of the day. Enjoy. Yeah. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. That was excellent. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, we'll talk soon. Okay, bye-bye.